Thank you all for coming this afternoon. Yeah, my name is Matthew Skick. I'm the assistant curator at the Museum of the American Revolution in Philadelphia, a brand new institution that opened up uh, on April 19th, 2017, the 242nd anniversary of the Battles of Lexington and Concord, the beginning of the Revolutionary War. So a brand new institution in the heart of Old City, two blocks away from the Independence Hall, a block away from Carpenter's Hall, uh, so right, right in the heart of the historic district of the city. We're specifically at the corner of 3rd and Chestnut Street. So uh, have any of you been uh, to the museum already? A few of you have, great. Thank you for coming and, and for, the, for the rest of you, uh, maybe the Cumberland County Historical Society can organize a bus trip uh, to Philadelphia to make it easier for a lot of people to, to travel to the city. Uh, but we hope to see you uh, come and, uh, for a visit. Today, I'm, uh, I'm gonna spend uh, some time with you talking about the history of the project, uh, the collection that we have on display at the museum, our exhibits, and, uh, and, and some projects that we're working on at, as well. Uh, so, to give you a, a bit of a background, the Museum of the American Revolution has the mission to uh, engage um, a, a variety of audiences with the history of the American Revolution the, and the founding era of the United States of America, and also to encourage people to engage with the ideals stated in the Declaration of Independence. Uh, when uh, the idea for the Museum of the American Revolution was really gaining steam, there were uh, a number of different surveys that were, were sent out to try and gauge um, interest level in the American Revolution, what kind of prior knowledge our, our, our future visitors would have. And many, uh, what that, uh, one of the uh, big takeaways of those surveys was that many Americans have trouble distinguishing between what the Declaration of Independence is, a, a document that states the founding ideals of the United States of America, and what the United States Constitution is. Uh, a lot of people conflate the two, I think they're, think they're the same thing. Uh, the Constitution, of course, is the document that lays out our system of government. Declaration is a, is a statement of ideals. So those two different, differing aspects. And in Philadelphia, maybe you visited the National Constitution Center before, an institution dedicated to uh, increasing understanding of what the Constitution is and, and the words, words of the Constitution. Uh, in, in, in contrast to the Constitution Center, we're really trying to encourage greater learning about the Declaration of Independence and how the Declaration of Independence is really the, um, the seminal moment of the American Revolution. And uh, the fact that the American Revolution continues to this day because we're still living out the legacy of the uh, uh, Declaration of Independence and trying to fulfill its ideals. So that's uh, part of our goal as, as an institution. Um, but to go back uh, uh, in time uh, a bit, Uh, the collection of the Museum of the American Revolution uh, really has its uh, start at Valley Forge uh, with a man named uh, Reverend W. Herbert Burke. And Her uh, Reverend Burke was an Episcopalian minister who uh, was the rector of All Saints Church in Norristown, Pennsylvania. And as a boy, when he was growing up, he would go with his father to uh, places like uh, Valley Forge and, and learn about history. His father was also an avid collector of, of Native American artifacts, and the collecting bug sort of rubbed off on Reverend Burke. And in 1903, inspired by General George Washington's leadership of the Continental Army and the Army's survival at the winter encampment at Valley Forge in 1777 to 1778, uh, Burke had the idea to create a memorial for uh, General Washington. And that took the form of the Washington Memorial Chapel, uh, seen here on the left, which you can still visit today at Valley Forge National Historic Park. A chapel that, that's dedicated to the Continental Army and specifically George Washington. But uh, Burke didn't want to stop there. He had aspirations to create a national scale museum dedicated to the American Revolution. And that took the form of the Valley Forge Museum of, the, of American History. That was his first step to get this dream accomplished. And that museum was housed at the Washington Memorial Chapel. But he didn't yet have a collection to, to put in that museum, so he started collecting. And the first object he buys, uh, he buys it in 1909, and it's a pretty significant object. It's George Washington's tent. Uh, the marquee tent that George Washington used as Commander-in-Chief of the Continental Army uh, during the Revolutionary War. 
Department. This is his mobile field headquarters. We like to call it today the uh, first Oval Office. We give it, give it that name because it is an oval-shaped tent, so it, it, it works. But uh, Reverend Burke actually bought this tent. He, he purchased it from a descendant of Martha Washington. George and Martha Washington together did not have their own children, but Martha Washington had two children from a previous marriage, so she had direct descendants. And they um, uh, uh, continued on carrying the, the Washington uh, Custis legacy. Um, and when Martha Washington died in the early 1800s, all of the Washington relics were uh, 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 given to descendants and, and, and dispersed a little bit. Um, but the majority of them were given to George Washington Park Custis, uh, George, Washington, George Washington's step-grandson. And uh, he had his own idea of building a, a bit of a memorial to George Washington. And that memorial took the form of Arlington House, which you can visit today at Arlington National Cemetery. Uh, and George Washington Park Custis's uh, daughter, her name was Mary Custis, married Robert E. Lee. And Mary Custis Lee and Robert E. Lee uh, moved into Arlington House and were now the caretakers of all the Washington relics, including Washington's tent, his china, and the porcelain that he used, other, other uh, war-related materials, but the Civil War strikes. And in, uh, at the beginning of the war, the Union Army immediately went to go occupy uh, uh, the Lee's home, Arlington House. And a, all of the relics had been stored there. They were stored in the basement. And an enslaved woman named Selena Gray was given the keys to protect these uh, artifacts. And uh, she actually basically approached the Union general um, and, and, and uh, that was commanding the, uh, the army at, in, in that area and said that there are a lot of national treasures down here that shouldn't be destroyed because there was threat of the soldiers going in and, and looting the place and taking souvenirs, and some souvenirs were taken. Pieces were cut from the tent, um, and so the, 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 these treasures risked being lost forever um, or, or, or broken up into different pieces. So what the United States government did is that they actually took all of those relics out of Arlington House and brought them to Washington City for safekeeping. The government held on to these um, artifacts and put them on display in Washington, D.C., but then eventually the Custis Lee family, led by Mary Custis Lee, oh, the, the second uh, uh, woman with that name pictured here on the left, uh, she's trying to get the uh, relics back into, their, into the uh, family's hands, and she's successful. And uh, however, she decides that she wants to sell uh, some of the relics, including the tent. One of the things she's trying to do is raise money for a home for needy Confederate widows that was going to be built in Richmond, Virginia. And so she thinks that selling the tent would raise enough money to uh, help, help fund that institution. And uh, so she decides that she's going to sell the tent. She puts ads in newspapers. And it's her dream that the tent should be in Philadelphia, right, in, uh, right next to Independence Hall, right next to the Liberty Bell. It, because it is this national treasure. So she puts an ad out in the Pennsylvania Evening Bulletin saying that she wants it here, uh, wants it in Philadelphia. And who buys it? That's Reverend Burke. He, he raises money, the $5,000 necessary to buy the tent, acquires it, puts it on display first at his Valley Forge Museum of American History. You can see the tent on display here. Uh, and then surrounded by other artifacts that, that are related to Washington and the Revolutionary War. The tent is Burke's first purchase, but he doesn't stop there. He continues uh, purchasing objects from the period, uh, and uh, that includes George Washington's silver camp cups made for him in Philadelphia in 1777. Probably recognize that painting there, an iconic American painting, uh, painted in 18, 1883 by William B. T. Trago, a Philadelphia artist. His depiction of Washington's army marching in the Valley Forge. It's just about in every, uh, every history textbook that you can think of now. Really an iconic painting. And uh, uh, Burke's collection is growing. He founds the Valley Forge Museum, uh, excuse me, the Valley Forge Historical Society in 1918 uh, to continue on his legacy. Burke passes away in 1933, never really fully achieving a national scale museum dedicated to the Revolution. However, the Valley Forge Historical Society still tries to tried to continue on that legacy, and they founded a new nonprofit organization to rebuild a new fundraising effort to build this national scale museum. And that's called the National Center of the American Revolution. And they had plans to build that museum at Valley Forge National Historic Park. 
here's an artist's rendering of what it, what it would look like. It was, it was a combination of a museum, a conference center, and, and hotel complex, a really a, a center for the study of the American Revolution. However, there was a lot of opposition to the project at that point. And uh, in the uh, late uh, 1990s, when, when uh, these uh, sorts of renderings, and in the early 2000s, when these renderings were coming out, many people did not want to see this museum at Valley Forge because it was actually going to be built on uh, a piece of property that was acquired that was actually part of the historic encampment in uh, 1777 to 1778. So a deal was struck to change the trajectory of this project. And a, a, a deal was negotiated between the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, the National Park Service, and the National Center for the American Revolution to do a land swap. The 15 acres that was owned by the National Center would be given to the National Park Service and sub, uh, uh, assumed into Valley Forge National Historic Park. And then a relatively unused piece of property in the heart of Old City, Philadelphia, that at the corner of Third and Chestnut, one acre of property would be given to the National Center for the American Revolution to build a new museum. What was on that property, though, you can see in this photograph on the left, was a rather ugly building, in my opinion. Uh, it was the old Independence National Historic Park Visitor Center. And by the early 2000s, a new visitor center had been built on Independence Mall, visible from Independence Hall. So this building was still being used by the Park Service, but since the bicentennial, this building had been used as the, the starting point for, uh, for visitors to explore historic Philadelphia. Uh, but uh, the building itself was, was, had fallen out of favor. Uh, a bell that Queen uh, Elizabeth had given to the United States was hidden in that bell tower. You couldn't even see it. Um, it, it, was, it was a building without windows, as you can see. It, it really was not a, not, a, not a nice place to be. Uh, so this property was, was given to the National Center, uh, and uh, a new building design was established, and a new capital campaign was initiated uh, in order to raise $150 million to build this, build this museum. The uh, building itself was designed by a New York architect, uh, Robert A.M. Stern. Uh, he's, one of his famous commissions is the tallest building in Philadelphia, the Comcast Center. Uh, if you've been to, been to the city, you've, you've probably seen it. Uh, but this was his first museum building that he's designing. A, a building that would fit into the architecture of the, of the uh, uh, section of Old City with the United States Custom House behind it. So a brick, a brick structure. Uh, 118,000 square feet um, building for, for this new museum. Ground was broken in 2014, so uh, building uh, began to start, uh, and fundraising was going quite well. Uh, uh, and the majority of the funding, with the exception of a, a, a gift from the Commonwealth of Pennsylvania, all of it has been private donation or a, a corporate donation. This is not a federally funded museum, it's its own nonprofit organization. The National Center for uh, the name, the National Center for the American Revolution was changed and shortened to the Museum of the American Revolution. And that's what it would be known as and, and continues to be known as. So when ground was broken in 2014, the uh, old Independence Visitor Center had just been built on a concrete slab. It didn't have a, a, a basement or a foundation or a deep foundation. The, building with, uh, the new building was going to be designed with a basement level for collection storage, classroom space, other exhibit areas. So we needed to dig down. And in order to do that, archaeology work had to be, had to be done. And uh, you can see some of the archaeologists at work here. And you can see that they're uncovering um, this here. Anybody recognize what this could be? A well, maybe, or a privy. Privy, it's a, it's a privy pit. There were a number of different privy pits that were found on the site, some of them dating to the mid to late 18th century. What was found on the site of the, muse the future Museum of the American Revolution was one of the most significant archaeological finds in the history of Philadelphia. 85,000 artifacts were pulled from these privy pits dating to 18th and 19th century uh, Philadelphia. So literally on the site of the museum was, was history, obviously. <laughs> And some of the amazing artifacts that were found in those privy pits included uh, this bowl. Uh, so what do we see here? It says, it has a ship on it, British flag, visible here. Success to the Trifina. The Trifina 
was a merchant vessel that traveled back and forth between Liverpool, England, and Philadelphia during the 1760s. And in 1765, the Trifina um, uh, became really significant. 1765, Philadelphia got word of the impending Stamp Act, the first direct tax ever implemented on the colonies by Parliament. And Philadelphia merchants were not too happy about it. And so they got together, signed a petition, and sent that petition back to England to try and encourage other uh, merchants in England to side with them and encourage the repeal of the Stamp Act. That petition was sent back to England aboard the Trifina. Uh, that we, we, we were able to encounter this through newspaper research and, and found it. A bowl uh, was made to commemorate the Trifina in England. The bowl was sent back to Philadelphia. This is uh, tin glazed earthenware, hand painted. Uh, and then it was, the bowl was actually used on the site of the future museum of the American Revolution. There were two taverns that operated on the site. One was illegal, one didn't have a license. Uh, it was recognized as a disorderly house. We found the privy of that, of that, of that um, uh, tavern. Another one was a licensed tavern. So just imagine the stories that this bowl could tell us, right? So imagine uh, the, the, the men and, and perhaps women in these taverns drinking rum punch with citrus fruits coming up from the Caribbean, uh, drinking, sharing, passing this bowl around, taking sips. And uh, they're talking about, likely, the beginnings of the American Revolution. And little did they know in 1765 that the museum dedicated to that very story of the American Revolution would be built on the site. It gives me chills when I come to think of it. This bowl is now on display at the, at the museum for you to see. That's a, one of the incredible stories that we, we unpacked. And so the building rose up from that, uh, that, that big site. And uh, on Octo in October of uh, 2016, I was ready to be uh, moved into uh, by our staff members in preparation for our opening, which was scheduled for April of 2017. It's a really beautiful building, but I encourage you all to come, come see it. Meanwhile, the Museum of the American Revolution had two offices, one in downtown uh, Philadelphia, that was our executive office, but then we had our secret location, our bat cave, our uh, fortress of solitude in Phoenixville, Pennsylvania. And uh, when I joined the staff in June of 2016, I had been an intern beforehand uh, during my master's degree. I was working at that old textile warehouse uh, in Phoenixville where our collection was stored. The collection uh, the, of the Museum of the American Revolution represented uh, a combination of Reverend Burke's old collection from the Valley Forge Historical Society, which had been transferred from the ownership of the Valley Forge Historical Society to the Museum of the American Revolution. Uh, and then newer acquisitions and some donations uh, uh, to build a collection of about uh, 3,000 artifacts uh, and that range from um, military artifacts, including Washington's tent, to uh, personal items, documents, um, uh, et cetera, from a period of roughly uh, 1750 to roughly 1800, uh, with, with some, some uh, later uh, exceptions. But that was all stored at, at this uh, uh, warehouse. And this is also the site where we were developing our exhibit plan, uh, uh, going through uh, documents, uh, making, uh, uh, making decisions about what stories to tell in this uh, uh, new museum. And the, the revolution uh, is, the, the American Revolution is something that's quite hard to define. Uh, in, what, in some ways it's still ongoing. Um, and even at, during the period, the American Revolution and what, it, what, was, what was considered the revolution was debated. For example, John Adams thought that the American Revolution was, uh, or had already taken place in the hearts and minds of the people in the 1750s and 60s. Whereas Benjamin Rush, the, the uh, Philadelphia physician, thought that the Revolutionary War was just the first act of the American Revolution, the first act of a great drama. And he thought that the, the, the American Revolution wasn't even close to being over. So we actually uh, uh, interpreted the uh, revolution more, of, uh, in more in line with what um, Benjamin Rush's ideas were, uh, a bit more than uh, what John Adams was thinking. But um, we had a space that we had to fill with objects. So the, the architect kind of uh, designed the, um, the, the structure but then it was our job to design the exhibits along with an exhibit design firm. 
And you can see here uh, one of my supervisors, our vice president of collections, exhibitions, and programming, Scott Stevenson, Scott Stevenson in the early stages, actually putting pen to paper, pencil to paper, and drawing plans uh, for exhibits. And this is what Gallery 9 is, very close to what it looks like today. So it's, it's amazing uh, what Scott was able to do uh, from his own, his own talents. Uh, but we, we broke up a um, chronology of, of time. We decided that chronology would be the best way to present the, the story of the American Revolution. Uh, and we broke up that roughly 30-year chronology that we were going to talk about from about 1760 to 1790 using four questions uh, throughout the galleries. The first question we ask is, how did people become revolutionaries? What drove them to the point of tearing down a statue of King George III in Bowling, in, on the Bowling Green in New York City after the words of the Declaration of Independence were read? What, what drove them to the point of calling for a Republican form of government that would represent the people? Uh, how did the Revolutionary War begin? Uh, and then the next question we have is, how did the revolution survive its darkest hour? When New York was lost in 1776 to the British, how did Washington's army then um, survive uh, that calamitous retreat through New Jersey, survive after a crossing of the Delaware and win a small victory at Trenton that really reinvigorated the cause? How did they survive a winter at Valley Forge uh, in which about 2,500 uh, soldiers in the army died from disease alone? Third question we ask is how revolutionary was the war? <coughs> How did the ideals of the of all men are created equal apply to the variety of people that are trying to participate in the American Revolution or stop it in its tracks? Fourth question, how did the revolution survive its, uh, excuse me, how, what kind of nation did the revolution create? That's going towards after the war is over, uh, what, kind of, what kind of government would this new nation have? Uh, who would be represented in government? Who would be allowed to vote? Those kinds of questions are what we're getting at with, with that fourth, fourth question. And these are uh, sort of taking a page out of, these questions are sort of taking a page out of science museums, asking questions of the visitors that are sort of rhetorical questions, but guide your thinking so that you can come to an answer yourself by looking at the exhibits. And uh, so there's not one answer to any of these questions, uh, but different people might come away with different, different ideas. And uh, so, once we were able to move into the building in October of 2016, that's when exhibit fabrication started to begin. One of our biggest projects was installing uh, three large paintings in our uh, second floor atrium. And the second floor is where uh, the main exhibit is. Uh, this is a uh, uh, late 19th century copy of the Coudere painting of Washington and Rochambeau at Yorktown. The original painting hangs at Versailles. Uh, this is obviously a one-to-one -one copy and a frame had to be built specifically for this uh, uh, for, uh, painting on the floor of that atrium because you couldn't fit the frame through the doors of the museum because it's way too big. Uh, so it had to be built, it's made of mahogany, it's gilt with gold, uh, but, and hoisted onto the wall. The painting is, is, is stabilized with I, I, an iron support structure, so it's, it's, it's stable, stable on that wall. Huge undertaking, it, it, it epitomizes the amount of work that went into installing these exhibits. And all of the exhibit installation happened from, like I said, October, and we finished uh, in March of 2017. Uh, last touches, of course, were, were done right before we opened, we opened in April, but um, the majority of the work was done by March. So a short window of time to get this all ready to go. And I was about the 15th staff member hired in June of 2016. Now we have a staff of about 120, and that includes part-timers. So we have expanded quite a bit since 2016 alone. And you can see what that atrium looks like now, second floor. So on April 19th, 2017, we opened our doors to the public. Here's a view of what the museum looked like on that day. The, the day began with a procession from uh, a spot in the city called Washington Square Park, which is where the tomb of the unknown revolutionary soldier is. There's a, an eternal flame burning. It's where hundreds of uh, men and women were buried who died uh, during the Revolutionary War. They're actually buried in that park. Um, so we started there, processed down to uh, Independence Hall. And by the way, the participants in this procession were uh, representatives of each of the 13 original states of the United States with uh, 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 former governors, current governors, and lieutenant governors participating as well. 
uh, marching down the streets of Philadelphia, stopping at Independence Hall, speeches there, and then we ended up at the front door of the museum. Former Vice President Biden cut the ribbon along with David McCullough, Cokie Roberts, uh, and the mayor of Philadelphia. So it was a, a star-studded uh, cast for, for the opening, and uh, we officially opened our doors. By the, uh, uh, before I move on, by the way, the, uh, the capital campaign was also doing very well. Um, by the time we opened our doors, we had surpassed the goal, and the capital campaign was officially finished in uh, uh, December of uh, 2017, so it just closed. And we reached uh, $165 million. So we surpassed, surpassed our goal by $15 million. And the, the surpassed goal, uh, so the, entire, the building is paid for, the, um, um, the exhibits are paid for, and then we established a small endowment for the museum as well uh, from, that, from that portion of it. So to talk about uh, what's going on in the museum, there's a lot of behind the scenes work to develop all of, the, all of the content, not only the content, but how we present that content. We present it through touchscreen interactives, object, historical object displays, uh, also uh, videos. Here we have a glimpse of a, a behind the camera um, filming of the way we, uh, we were gonna present uh, on the left there, on the right there, to me, the Battle of Brandywine, and then uh, how we were going to present Washington's original tent, because that was going to be the centerpiece of, of our exhibits. We also uh, recreated the tearing down of the statue of King George in front of a huge green screen. We filmed this in, in actually Chester County and, and uh, uh, computer generated 18th century New York. Uh, into a scene, and this is the, the scene that would greet you as that greets you as you go into the exhibits. Uh, you can feel like you're almost pulling on one of the ropes to tear down the statue of King George, part of this revolutionary moment. And here's the statue itself. We recreated the statue and, and put it up uh, in the space as well later on in the galleries. We worked with a company out of Brooklyn, New York, called Studio Ice, e, Studio E I S, um, and they specialize in resin and. Uh, bronze figures that are extremely realistic. So they actually recreated uh, the um, statue of King George based on descriptions and based on surviving, a handful of surviving pieces of the statue. When the statue was torn down, by the way, it's, it was made of lead, gilt with gold. It was melted down by, the, uh, by women in Connecticut into musket balls. 42,000 musket balls <laughs> fired back in the British. So pretty, uh, uh, pretty interesting story there. We, we tell that story and have a couple objects a couple pieces of the statue on display at the museum on loan to us from the New York Historical Society. As we go through the chronology of, the, uh, of this seven time period from 1760 to 1790, we begin at the tail end of the French and Indian War when Britain claims a vast new empire, uh, go through up through the uh, rising colonial tensions with Great Britain, here we have the gallery that talks about the beginning of the war, Lexington and Concord. At the center of this gallery is a piece of the North Bridge at Concord in which the uh, Minutemen and British regulars fought over on that morning where the shot heard around the world was, was, was fired. And that's taken from uh, the words of Ralph Waldo Emerson. And flanking the piece of the bridge are objects carried by the Minutemen that day or related to the Minutemen that, that fought that day and objects related to the British regulars. For example, that uh, fowling piece there, a hunting gun, was, is part of our collection, uh, carried by Captain David Brown, who was one of the officers of the Concord Minute Company, who fought at the, at the bridge that day. And uh, above the bridge, we have animated uh, a, uh, a print done by Amos Doolittle, a Connecticut soldier, who went up uh, after the battles, interviewed participants, and produced prints as the closest thing we can get to eyewitness depictions of the battles of Lexington and Concord. So we've animated that to bring, it, bring them to life um, on, on the screen. We have original flags on display as well to show the changing symbolism of the, uh, of, of, that Americans were using uh, during this revolution. Uh, a flag that shows America's connections to Great Britain with the Great Union in the, in the Canton and then a flag that, whose canton was altered at some point, probably right after 1776. It probably used to have a great union of white stripes in the top left corner, uh, but those stripes were removed from the flag and cut up into smaller stripes. So you see six stripes on this side, there are seven on the other. Six plus seven is 13. Uh, 
this is a new flag that's symbolizing the 13 United States of America following the Declaration of Independence. Other objects include great paintings, a, a depiction of a British officer that we, we purchased at auction. William Crosby, who was a participant in the battles of Lexington and Concord, led part of the Concord ex, uh, expedition to go capture military supplies. One of three surviving hunting shirts from the period of the uh, Revolutionary War, a distinctive American garment uh, worn by uh, Pennsylvania, Maryland, and Virginia riflemen who were coming up to join the Army in 1775, carrying highly accurate rifles. Some of the rifles made here in, 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 in this area, in Lancaster County, Berks County. Uh, they're, they're going up to Boston with those, with those rifles in hand, wearing hunting shirts like this one and it really scared some of the New England soldiers that they were fighting, fighting alongside. It also frightened the British because officers were noting that if they saw men in hunting shirts, they automatically assumed that they were, they were marksmen, they were riflemen. And uh, so Washington employed uh, hunting shirts to, for a psychological effect too and, and adopted it as a, a sort of uniform for the Continental Army to show that every one of them could have been a marksman. We have a, a really uh, fantastic display of, of weaponry as well. This is our Arms of Independence display to give you a cross-section of the types of weapons that were carried by American soldiers at the beginning of the war and then at the end of, uh, towards the end of the war. And uh, below the objects themselves are three touch screens which allow you to explore each of the objects in detail with a, a touch of your finger with high resolution photography. So you can manipulate the, the photographs, zoom in on details, and then we've called out uh, different details in the, uh, with the firearms uh, so you can understand the person who carried that arm, their, their story, the significance of the symbols on, their, on the guns that they carry, what they, what they mean, and not only to um, the person that carried them, but to, uh, in a broader historical sense, what, what their significance is. You can walk aboard a privateer ship, or at least the bow of a privateer ship. Uh, this was created for us by the Independent Seaport Museum in, in Philadelphia. If this was a, if this was a full, full ship, it could sail. It, it was built um, to be a, 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 like a sailing vessel, but the size of a, a sloop or a single-masted vessel, uh, reminiscent of the privateer ships that were uh, private vessels given licenses by the Continental Congress to go attack uh, enemy vessels to make do for the small Continental Navy uh, and in its fight against the British Royal Navy. You can walk under the boughs of a liberty tree uh, and, and uh, this is a symbol, symbolic uh, site for, for protests and hearing the news that uh, not only Bostonians used during the 1760s but there were liberty trees in many of the cities up and down the uh, East Coast. Uh, and in, embedded into that tree is a piece of an actual liberty tree. It's the Annapolis, Maryland liberty tree that was on the grounds of St. John's College. And so you can actually touch a piece of history as you're going through. You can, you can feel, feel that, that wood. And um, uh, it's amazing how people have reacted to, the, to that, just being able to touch. And what's great about what the Chester County Historical, excuse me, the uh, Cumberland County Historical Society is doing upstairs is that you can, there's so many hands-on aspects. That's something that we tried to do in the, in the museum as well. Rather than just have everything behind, um, behind glass, you can actually touch maybe a reproduction of something and get a sense of what it may, may have been like to um, um, be in the 1760s or, or be in um, a, a Revolutionary War battle. Using reproductions, using immersive environments is, is a, a technique that we use, just like what's being done here. Touchscreen Interactive is some of the latest technology. We, we tried to use it sparingly, and that was purposely done in the museum. We tried not to overload the museum with touchscreen interactives. We have four in, six, in a 16,000 square foot gallery space. And for a uh, modern uh, museum of this size, that's low for, for the amount of, of technology. So we used it strategically. Uh, in some cases, uh, for example, you can see touch screens here. We're presenting historical documents. Documents pr present problems for display because they have, need to have low light levels uh, and then uh, need to have a, uh, need to take up a little bit of real estate due to the case furniture that, that needs to house them. But in order to uh, encourage visitors to interact with documents, 
we had high resolution photography done of the documents and then you can zoom right in, see the texture of the paper, almost treat the document like an object. But then we hotspot the content in the, uh, in the document so you can learn more about the context for why uh, uh, Paul Revere's engraving of the Boston Massacre looks the way it does and compare it to other images from the period that also depict the British in Boston. So an interactive way to encourage visitors to engage with documents. One of the projects I worked on, and, and when I was hired, I was brought on to develop, uh, do all the research, content writing, and uh, be the art director for the touchscreen interactives. One of the projects I'm most proud of is called Finding Freedom, African Americans of Wartime Virginia. And uh, we focus in on 1781 Virginia in the months leading up to the siege of Yorktown when the British and American armies were uh, battling through the state of Virginia. And for the thousands of uh, free and enslaved African Americans uh, in that state, they were, they were faced with difficult decisions when chaos is, is, is forming in, in their society. Um, and they are faced with decisions, should I join the British and seek freedom? Should I side with the American revolutionaries and uh, uh, seek freedom? Should I try and stay out of the conflict? Maybe, maybe I should just go out and do and fight my own battles. So we, we, we tell the story of five different individuals through primary documents that you can explore on screen, but we do it in a way of uh, sort of an interactive storybook where you can uh, where we put the narrative in the voice of the uh, person that's uh, being presented and then allow you to explore documents related to their lives, evidence of, of their lives. So we focus on Eve, London, Jack, Deborah, and Andrew, five real individuals who all made different decisions when faced with the, with the similar scenarios. For example, uh, London was a 15-year-old um, enslaved um, young man who worked on a plantation just, uh, just outside of Richmond, and he made the decision to join what became known as the American Legion, not the veterans organization, but a legion of uh, infantry and dragoons founded by the recent turncoat Benedict Arnold, who is now a British commander, a brigadier general, leading the British charge into Virginia. And uh, London joined as a trumpeter that, that legion and fought in Virginia and Connecticut. And he eventually did receive his freedom and settled in Nova Scotia. Deborah was enslaved to George Washington at Mount Vernon and ran away when Mount Vernon was almost burned in 1781 when a British ship sailed up the Potomac River. She made the decision to seek her own freedom. She also, like London, boarded a ship and ended up in Nova Scotia. So these stories uh, we tell bring, the, bring these people to life. When we don't have many objects that can drive the narrative to, to tell their stories, we use a, a, a different technique, uh, a, a, a sort of a storytelling technique to bring their stories to life. And we do that through artwork. So I work with artists who have little experience uh, depicting the 18th century. Uh, and their original drafts look more like Disney illustrations but then we work with them to understand material culture, objects, using period images, and this is the final product that you see on screen. Uh, so getting uniform details right for, for what, the, what a British officer would have looked like in Virginia in 1781, uh, using period objects, period dis, um, paintings to um, make the 18th century come to life on paper in an, through an illustration. The, tablo the figures that I mentioned uh, earlier regarding Studio Ice, we use dioramas, an old museum technique, uh, but we make them hyper-realistic using uh, reproduction clothing, uh, and um, so, so clothing based on original examples, worn by figures, and when you look into the faces of these figures, it almost look like, looks like you're talking to a, a real person. You can look into the face of George Washington as he's breaking up a fight that broke out between his soldiers in the winter of 1775 to 1776. And uh, we unpack that story uh, of how Washington was seen as a unifying force for his, his army when a diverse collection of Americans are coming together to try and fight for one cause. Washington is that, that unifying force. And you can see how these figures are created. Some of my colleagues there with some of the first <laughs> figures that were finished. Uh, but they're resin, and then they're, they're life cast from real individuals, uh, and then painted by artists to make them look realistic. Here they are in the Brooklyn studio before they were installed into the museum. You might recognize this guy, because I 
was actually life cast for one of the figures. <laughs> I, have, I happen to be the same age as Private William Burke, a British soldier who first encountered uh, warfare when he fought in New York in 1776. He was 24 years old when he saw uh, the first gun, to quote him, that he ever saw discharged in anger. And uh, he was fighting against uh, other uh, Americans who were as young as 15, 14 years old. Uh, on, the, on, the, on the battlefield uh, on the opposite side. He was a new soldier. He was not a, a veteran soldier of the British Army. Uh, but I was light cast, my entire body, from my hair down to my, to my feet, uh, was cast in plaster, and then I was turned into a resin figure, and all my features were resin figures. <laughs> so it's, it's eerie sometimes I say hello to myself in the gallery. <laughs> 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 Here's a, a little bit of a glimpse uh, in the process. My colleague Adrian Whaley um, actually was life cast for one of the figures as well. Um, our educational programming to go along with our exhibits is quite robust. Uh, as I said, we have a staff of about 120. S about 60 of those are uh, called program facilitators. They're part-time uh, people who, um, and they're some of them are former teachers, some are college students, uh, some have graduate degrees. They are the, the, the folks who lead our school tours. And we've welcomed about 30,000, over 30,000 school uh, uh, students uh, into our doors in the first 10 months we've been open. And uh, they are leading um, uh, everything from storytelling to object uh, programming, as you can see in the top left corner. We also have five full-time gallery educators. They're sort of our docents that are in the galleries at all, at all times. Ryan there in the center talking to two young visitors on board the, the sloop, talking about what life was like at sea for some of the people that, that served on the ships. But the centerpiece of the museum is, of course, George Washington's tent that Burke had collected in 1909. And in order to display Washington's tent, it was quite a project. It's a large textile. And the project to display Washington's tent uh, can be likened to the project to display the Star Spangled Banner at the Smithsonian Institution in Washington, D.C., lar another large textile. And textiles can only be, uh, should only be exposed to so much light in order to preserve them for future, uh, for, so they can, can last, they don't deteriorate due to ultraviol ultraviolet um, exposure. Uh, so what we, what we did was, in order to minimize the amount of light that the tent would receive, we put it in its own glass case, separated from the rest of the exhibit, and put that glass case into a theater. And uh, a screen comes down in front of the glass of the case, and you sit and watch a theater presentation about Washington's leadership of the army, but also the history of the tent, how it ended up in the museum's collection. It's about 15 minutes, and at the end, the tent is dramatically revealed. I won't describe it any more than that, but it's because I encourage you to come see it for yourself. It has brought people to tears, and it, it's been a moving experience about how uh, a sim seemingly simple object, a, a linen tent, can have so much meaning to not just a, 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 a small uh, area, but a, the larger nation, and how this is a symbol of the enduring ideals of the Declaration of Independence. One of the ways we um, encourage interaction with the tent uh, prior to opening the museum was by making a one-to-one -one reproduction of it. And we partnered with Colonial Williamsburg to make a hand-sewn reproduction. And you can see some of the uh, craftsmen that were hired um, and interpreted at Williamsburg before we had our own building uh, to talk about making tents, military artificers, of military craftsmen. A lot of artis artificer work was actually going on here in Carlisle during the uh, Revolutionary War, making supplies like and, and repairing supplies for the Continental Army. Tent making is something that was happening here in Carlisle, for example. Um, making uh, so these craftsmen are making a reproduction of Washington's tent, so we could set it up, test it out. It served as our stunt double for creating a custom-built aluminum frame apparatus to display the original tent in that case as if it were standing on standing up in the field used by Washington uh, during the war. So this, the reproduction served as that stunt double, but it also serves as an educational outreach program. We take it to historic sites and set it up and allow visitors to go inside to feel like uh, they are General Washington on campaign. You can sit in a reproduction of his camp furniture, uh, sit on his bed, 
uh, see what it was like for Washington on campaign. This is uh, the line of people that were waiting to get into the tent at Mount Vernon uh, last year. So the tent is displayed in this case with this aluminum frame apparatus supporting it, making it look like the tent is actually being pulled by all the ropes that originally had, had uh, been used to set up the tent. But in reality, the ropes are just an illusion. What is doing all the work is that, is that frame, and the tent is resting on that frame, and between the tent and the frame is a sub-tent, um, a, a, a cloth tent that supports the original, original fabric. Uh, so the stress and, and pull of, the, of gravity on that linen is minimized as, as much as possible. Uh, and so the tent is, is in stable condition in that display case, um, and all of the um, ropes are just, just an illusion. The museum continues to collect, uh, and one of the recent acquisitions that the museum made a month after we opened our doors is a really important watercolor. It's a depiction of the Continental Army's encampment at Burplanks Point, New York, and that took place in 1782. And this watercolor was a really significant find, not just for the study of the American Revolution, because this hadn't been this watercolor was previously unknown. Uh, but it was really important, a really important find for the Museum of the American Revolution. Because prior to this, we did not have a period eyewitness depiction of George Washington's tent in the field. Nobody had, had painted it uh, when it was actually used in, in the field. Um, it, it only, we only had were photographs of it set up later on in the 19th century and early 20th century. But now, with this watercolor, what we noticed in it is that it actually shows Washington's tent in the left-hand corner on a hill. Based on descriptions of this encampment, we knew uh, what this encampment looked like, and all the details from those descriptions matched what we were seeing in the watercolor, including Washington's tent perched on a hill overlooking the encampment. Here is the tent set up in that encampment with two guards of the Commander Chief's guard standing, standing guard there and a temporary wooden structure was built in front of Washington's tent to create a more of a grand entrance for, for General Washington at this specific encampment, which was actually meant to impress the French army under Rochambeau that was marching by. Uh, so Washington's tent was on the hill, but this is what we have as the only known eyewitness depiction of George Washington's tent in the field, the very same tent that we have on display at the Museum of the American Revolution. We just closed a, our first temporary exhibit, a short-term exhibit, to display this watercolor and expand upon its, its historical context and significance. Uh, so we found a, a, really, a truly a, a national treasure at auction last year. Uh, so very, very happy about that. The way we finish off the exhibit is by allowing you to look at photographs or, or reproductions of photographs of men and women who lived through the years of the Revolutionary War and lived long enough to be photographed. So many people think if they don't see a photograph of something, it didn't happen, right? <laughs> there, we don't have photographs of the Battle of Bunker Hill. We don't have a photograph of the Boston Tea Party. Uh, period images and later depictions of, of those scenes sometimes make them seem mythical. But here, you can actually look into the eyes of the first generation of Americans. And they're looking back at you, the, the current generation of Americans. And it's meant to make you think about the ideals of the revolution. And as you leave the exhibit, there are a set of mirrors. And the words, meet the future of the American Revolution. Because all of us are continuing the legacy that these, these men and women fought and, and sometimes um, uh, uh, died for. Um, uh, uh, to, to live in a country dedicated to the people and uh, uh, a country dedicated to representing the people in, in their government. So I encourage you all to come to 3rd and Chestnut Street in Old City, Philadelphia to visit the Museum of the American Revolution. And thank you very much for coming this afternoon. <laughs>
do, do you have uh, any knowledge of like a point to like the National Archives or something that if somebody were to come there and say I want more information, you can say go here? Yes, yeah, we get, we answer those questions all the time. And that's something I, one of the, the big pro, uh, parts of my job is to answer public inquiry. So if we can help somebody with an answer, we'll, we'll try our best. But if not, we'll direct you to um, whether it's the David Library of the American Revolution, the National Archives, the American Antiquarian Society, those institutions are, are better equipped uh, for answering a lot of genealogy questions we get, um, historical questions we get, but we do our best to help, help uh, visitor, um, anybody that asks uh, with, their, with their question. So. Yes? Just a clarification, how many artifacts came out of those previews? 85,000. That's what I wrote down. I can't believe that. Isn't that amazing? Yeah. So the, all of those are now part of our collection, which is yeah. okay. So by the way, if, you, if, you're, up, if you're interested in decorative arts news and, and decorative arts history, which I'm sure some of you are, uh, not only did we find that Trifina punch bowl, which is really significant to the story of the American Revolution, but a, we found the first American-made hard paste porcelain, so true porcelain, in that privy pit. Um, so it's the first American made from, from American clay, made in Philadelphia, it's a bowl, small, small punch bowl, made of, of true porcelain. Not mimicked porcelain, but actually true porcelain. Um, and it's, so it's, we call it, it's known as the holy grail of punch bowl now. But, uh, and we've also found a really fantastic teapot uh, from that same um, uh, privy pit that is made of uh, an early attempt to at mimic porcelain, uh, but made in Philadelphia. So really significant ceramics were found on the site. Yeah, another question. Are they going into the privet then, as opposed to the Some of the uh, privy pits are, were used as, as a garbage um, disposal facility as well for a, a, a household. So <coughs> a, a, um, a ceramic breaks, for example, they could just put the shirts right into the, the privy pit as a way to dispose of them. Any other questions? Yes. What happened to the golf from Queen Elizabeth that was in the old oh, yeah. so, torn down? So the National Park Service still still has it. Okay. Yeah. So we just didn't get this started then. No, 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 no. Yes. What was the condition of Washington's tent when Reverend Burke bought it? Because by then it was like over hundred years old. Right. It, it was in pretty good shape for, for, for its age. And it had also been set up, as I alluded to previously, uh, a number of times uh, throughout the 1800s by George Washington Park Custis. He would set it up for um, sheep shearing festivals at Arlington House. Uh, he set it up for one time for the Marquis de Lafayette when he returned to the United States in 1824-25. And Mar the Marquis literally shed tears under the canvas because he, he returned to the, that site where he had spent time with Washington. Um, and so it, it, it was in the biggest uh, condition issue with the tent. The linen itself was in good shape, but the, some souvenirs had been taken out, taken out of it, including a large section of the roof. Um, so that made it difficult to set up. So when the uh, conservator, textile conservator that we worked with was preparing the tent for display at the museum, she had to uh, essentially create a patch for that hole so we could set it up. Um, it's a patch that you can't see on the, the publicly visible side of the tent, but it's a, it's a patch that you can see on the back side. But the way she did that patch was she had to make it, number one, reversible so you could easily remove it and easily identify it as a, an, a, a later addition to the tent, <coughs> so not to confuse it with the historical artifact. Um, but the way she, way she did it to make it almost like a, a seamless transition between the original and the um, um, modern materials that a high resolution photograph was taken of the weave structure of the tent and printed, screen printed onto a modern piece of, of, of cloth. And that cloth was then hand sewn to patch up that hole and that could be removed. So you, from one side, from the outside of the tent, you can't recognize the difference. But if you looked on the inside of the tent, you can immediately see the difference. Uh, so that's a, a way we worked with actually the, one of the colleges in Philadelphia uh, to encourage students to participate in the project to um, screen, think of an idea, a way to screen print uh, this um, cloth 
so that it would be uh, a great uh, way to patch this tent and prepare it structurally, structurally for display. So um, that hole was uh, a significant loss, but we, we may do with it. So. <laughs> yes? Uh, you mentioned the guided tours. I assume the public goes in in a self-guided situation, but the public, or the guiding is for special groups or what? So we have a number of different options that you can choose from. So the uh, uh, a standard ticket gets you a self-guided tour of the museum. Uh, and there are gallery educators stationed throughout the galleries to help you with questions and serve as your guide. They, they wouldn't follow you around where you go or lead you around where you go, um, but they're in different areas of the galleries ready, to, ready and willing to help you with uh, something you're, 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 you have a question about. There are also options, there are upcharge options for guided tours, early access tours, so you actually have a private tour with a, uh, either a curator or one of our gallery educators, meant for smaller groups. Our part-time program facilitators also lead uh, pre-scheduled uh, group tours at a discounted rate, uh, at a, a discounted group rate uh, for groups of 15 or more through the galleries. So you can, there's a number of different options you can choose from. Any other questions? Yes. Is it known where Washington's tent was actually uh, originally made? So, uh, so there were Washington had uh, two sets of tents made during the Revolutionary War. One appears to have worn out by, uh, by the time of the Valley Forging campaign. And that first set was made in Philadelphia by a man named Plunkett Fleeson. Yes, that's his real name, Plunkett Fleeson. He was an upholsterer in Philadelphia. Um, the, uh, but using his skills in textile and, and construction to make a tent for Washington. That tent seems to wear out and a new set of tents is made uh, and is delivered to Washington in the late spring of 1778. And that's what the believed to be the tent that we have. Um, that, as far as we know, well, we, it's, it's hard to be concrete with this, but we think that at least part of that tent was made in Reading, Pennsylvania. <laughs> so both Pennsylvania products. Uh, so many of, you, many of you have probably been to uh, the National Park Service Visitor Center at Yorktown in Virginia. Um, and many of you have also been to the Smithsonian. And some of you may be thinking, oh, I've seen Washington's tent elsewhere, right? So there's more than one tent that belonged to Washington. We have the tent that Washington used as his sleeping and office space. This is his personal space. We have the roof and wall, of one of the walls of that, that tent. On display at the National Park Service Visitor Center at Yorktown is a tent that served as an inner chamber for the tent that we have. It was an insulative layer for that tent and also broke the tent up into different rooms um, and actually was suspended from the ridge pole that held up Washington's tent. So you can actually see that tent on display at that National Park Service Visitor Center. The Smithsonian owns George Washington's dining tent, the, the tent he used as an entertainment and dining space. It's much larger than the, the tent that we have. Um, it's actually also visible in that in the watercolor. Um, Can't see, yeah, but it's actually right in there, that collection of tents. Um, it's not on display currently, but it was on display. I think it's as late as the not early 1990s, but Washington's dining tent is currently in storage. Uh, so currently, there are two spot places in the country where you can see uh, pieces of Washington's tents. We have the roof and wall of this sleeping out office tent. National Park Service has the inner chamber that was originally paired with our tent. Um, on display at Yorktown. Mm -hmm. Yes? The artifacts that would have been in the sleeping town, like chests or trunks or anything? What kind of artifacts would have been in there? Yeah. So uh, we can imagine that there was some camp furniture, and uh, two of Washington's camp stools survived. One's at the Smithsonian, one's at Tudor Place, Historic House and Gardens in Washington, D.C. Uh, and um, so he's probably using that those stools. He had 18 of them originally um, uh, in trunks wooden trunks. So he's probably sitting in those stools, sitting at a folding uh, desk. What we have from Plunkett Fleeson is a receipt of all the supplies that Washington is ordering from him, including the set of tents, the camp stools, boxes, a canteen, and a mess kit. Uh, and some of these survive. Uh, the, his canteen it survives at Mount Vernon. It's a leather case that carried uh, bot glass bottles. Um, his mess chest survives in the Smithsonian collection. That's his, like, cast iron griddle, 
uh, forks and knives, salt shakers, those sorts of things. Um, so those were probably in the tent as well. And the marquee that we have, that officer's tent that, that Washington used as a sleeping office space, it was really a personal space where Washington was writing letters, meeting with his, most, with his closest aides. It's also probably the only, the only other person that probably slept in that tent was uh, Billy Lee, William Lee, Washington's enslaved valet who accompanied him throughout the eight years of the Revolutionary War. He's probably the only other person that slept in that tent, apart from Washington. Washington's camp bed also survives. That was in the tent, um, and that's on display at Mount Vernon. You can see his, his actual bed that he slept in. Yes, last, last question. Are, are there new artifacts being discovered and donated? Almost on a daily basis, yes. <laughs> yeah, from all over the country, too. Little, little, little objects, um, uh, some really significant objects. So we are always on the lookout on, at, in, in auction catalogs. Um, uh, new offers come in from, from collectors, but then families. Uh, just like here at the Cumberland County Historical Society, families are offering donations. We recently accepted a donation of a sword that was carried by a Connecticut officer named Jonathan Pettibone from a direct descendant of his who now lives in Baltimore. And he wanted to uh, have the Jonathan Pettibone sword on display somewhere, uh, but he wasn't sure if he should put it in Connecticut or should he bring it to Philadelphia. And we encouraged him to, to donate it to us, so it's now in our collection. Uh, and it's, it's a fantastic sword. It has Jonathan Pettibone's name engraved on the guard, as well as the touch mark of the silversmith, Joseph Kopp, who made it. Um, uh, this is one of our recent acquisitions as well. We have um, manuscripts coming in um, from places like Arizona, Washington State. So people are, are, are donating from all over the place. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.